Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Willkommen, meine Damen und Herren. I am Marcus Aurelius, but for the length of this series, you can refer to me as Count Marcus von Aurelius. And the reason for that, of course, is that we are going to be playing Late Age Alm. This dark mixture of German and Transylvanian mythology with vampires running around everywhere, but not the kind that sparkle in the sunlight. No, the kind that kill relentlessly. I'm going to be using the two mods that I used in my previous Let's Play, Mobility by Llama Beast and Worthy Heroes by Burn Saber, though I doubt we'll ever see one of those Worthy Heroes because it's been something of a rarity for me. And I've added the No Indies mod by Sombledon. What this does is it helps the AI recruit more thematic armies for their nation. So instead of seeing piles and piles of heavy infantry and militia, instead you're seeing national troops. And I've made it so that I can recruit independent troops if I choose to do so. In most cases I won't as a house rule, but if it's something interesting like Amazons or cavalry, because Ulm only has cavalry recruitment in their home province, so, you know, things like that, but for the most part, I won't be, and the AI won't be either. I ran some tests with it, and it looks really good. The armies of each enemy nation are very thematic, and it's a lot more fun to play against. It also, I think, makes the AI a bit more difficult, so that's, that's pretty cool. I will be using the map Atha Avon by Pimus, who is also the gentleman who created Bidden that I played my Shinoyama campaign on. This map is about 90 land provinces or thereabouts, and it's suitable for four to eight players, though I've ran a few tests, and I find that while I initially wanted to play with five players, I'm going to reduce that to four to give everybody time to get situated. Now, as far as the enemy nations, I have chosen them based on semi-randomness. Now what I mean by semi-randomness is I ran a couple test games where I chose random nations. However, there were a few nations that I wanted purposely to exclude, that being Lemuria and Riley, because they both have dominions which do horrible things to population. Uh, Lemuria kills the population and Riley makes them insane. And in a multiplayer game, people would gang up on the player who played those nations, but in a single player game the AI just sits there happily and lets them ruin everything. So I figured it wouldn't be fun to add those. I also wanted to remove nations that we've seen already, such as Man and Arco from our Lemuria campaign. So basically the first three random nations that came up that weren't those four, and <laughs> Lemuria and Raleigh came up in my first test, believe it or not, are Agartha, the Catonian Dead, Pangea, the New Era, and Midgard, the Age of Man. I, of course, will be playing the Black Forest of Ulm. After years of civil war, the Iron Kingdom crumbled. During the Night of Treason, a great malediction was placed upon the kingdom. The forests became dark and hostile. Wolves and creatures even worse stalked the land. Slowly, the kingdom recovered, but it was not what it once was. The knightly order was all but destroyed, and the master smiths had disappeared. The secrets of black steel were forgotten. An order of black priests emerged in Ulm in the last days before the Civil War. They formed an iron cult, consolidated their position, and forbade the use of magic. Magic outside religion was announced to be sacrilegious, and the few surviving master smiths were put to the flames. Although majory is forbidden, there are some fortune tellers and members of the Order of the Illuminated Ones who secretly ply their trade in the arcane. Now this nation has good troops, it has stealthy troops, it has undead recruitable troops, which is interesting, it has astral magic, blood magic, earth, death, nature, and a little bit of fire but it's not particularly strong in any of them so it's diverse but not powerful 
and the priests are weak. Now for those of you who just want to see gameplay, you can go ahead and fast forward to the next video. But for those of you who, like me, are interested in the story and the characters that we are going to be encountering in this Let's Play, please stick around. So who is our pretender going to be? Well, 24 years before this new saga is set to unfold, in the nation of Ulm, beset by tragedy and the malediction, there was an influential lord from a powerful and historic family. Despite the trials of the malediction, they maintained their honor and influence when the future of Ulm seemed in doubt and all appeared covered in shadow. This lord conceived a child with his new wife, the love of his life. The two were inseparable. Unfortunately, tragedy struck, as it often did in those times, and shortly after delivering a healthy baby girl, his wife died due to the difficult birth. The Lord was devastated, but instead of blaming the child, he did the opposite. He lavished attention on her and gave her all his love and support, as she was the only living reminder of his beloved. The girl was named Katarina in honor of her mother and was an amazingly talented, precocious child. She had access to the best tutors and trainers in the realm read all the books in her father's library, and excelled in hunting, tracking, sword play, and all the martial arts of Ulm. At an age where other girls were playing with dolls, Katerina was advising her father on political matters and assisted in the management of his lands. As she grew older, however, her father became a bit nervous more and more as strange events seemed to follow in the girl's wake. One winter, a severe frost fell onto the lands, and the plants in the castle gardens all died. All, that is, except for the small garden that Katerina tended to personally. When she was young, she would often talk to herself, and when her father asked her about it, she assured him that she wasn't speaking to herself at all, but others all around her that he just couldn't see. Once, when she was recklessly crossing a frozen pond, the ice cracked beneath her and she was pulled under. When she was finally rescued by her breathless and shaken guards, she simply stood and walked away without even a shiver. Her father was a wise man, and he recognized magic when he saw it. Though long banished in the land of Ulm for generations, he knew if the black priests were informed of these strange events that Katerina would likely be imprisoned or burned at the stake like the master smiths of old. He had to act fast. Enlisting the service of his most trusted guards and stewards, he sent her, at the age of only fifteen, outside the lands of Ulm, with the stated purpose of continuing her mundane education, but in reality, so that she could pursue and develop her gifts in a more safe and welcoming environment. While sad to be parted, both father and daughter realized it had to be done. Once Katerina was safely outside the borders of Ulm, the Lord went to work. While up to this point he had stayed mostly out of politics, and the petty squabbles of the council of lords and priests, rarely using his influence, now he began to quietly consolidate his power, play a more active role, bolster his allies and raise them to positions of power, and marginalizing and removing his potential enemies. After five years, he was unquestioningly the most powerful man in Ulm, and even the mighty priesthood cast worried, fearful glances in his direction. The Lord stayed in frequent communication with his daughter as she went from one arcane master to the other, increasing and diversifying her skills. 
From her, he heard troubling news. For over a century, the Pantocrator hadn't played an active role in the mortal world. But now it was said that the Pantocrator was gone entirely, and that titans, specters, and monsters were rising up and raising armies to take the thrones of ascension, and with them, godhood for themselves. Reports of brutal wars and mighty ancient nations being annihilated reached her ears. In order to survive, father and daughter both knew Ohm must change. With the stage set five years to the day since she left, Katarina returned to Ohm, one of the most powerful great enchantresses the world had ever seen. Wasting no time, her father called a meeting of the council, where he introduced Katarina, and she explained all she had seen and heard on her travels. Her immense guile and her subtle but irresistible use of her magical power, along with her father's military might and his standing with the people, both impressed and cowed the assembled dignitaries to accept that in order to survive the times to come, Ulm must mobilize for war, accept limited magic, and most importantly, with pretender gods rising all across the land, they needed a new religion to guide them. One involving the priests, but not beholden to them. Like the pieces of an intricate puzzle, all the work of Katerina and her father came to fruition. And as she entered the chambers, a young, noble lady, she exited them, a pretender goddess. There was dissent, of course, from some of the priests and the nobles, but their swift and unexplained deaths ensured the obedience of those who remained. The people, who were at first frightened and nervous regarding this incredible change of events, began to wholeheartedly support them when it was discovered that by lighting a simple candle to Katerina, that their towns, homes, and lives became more orderly, more productive. Harvests were exceptional. And despite magic being practiced in the capital and keeps on the border, the dark creatures and unexplained events that were once common across the countryside slowly faded away. Within four years, all resistance disappeared, and the entire nation of Ulm stood behind Katerina, the now 24-year-old great enchantress, and prayed in her name every night. While her father continues to marshal the troops and begins to scout and conquer nearby lands, Katerina requires one more year to master her magic, commune with necessary spirits, and prepare for the oncoming storm. She gave up her family name, and from that moment forward was known only as Katerina von Ulm. So that's what we got going for us, folks. Now, as you're used to with me, I'm going to be boosting up the special sight frequency quite a bit. I'm going to be enabling the score graphs, increasing the Hall of Fame, and I'm going to be setting easy research because I would like to show some of the end game magic before everything is decided one way or the other. With Thrones of Ascension, I'm going to do it a little bit differently than I've done it before. I'm going to keep the one level three throne, but instead of level instead of two level two thrones, I'm going to go with only one and I'm going to keep four level one thrones. So basically, there's going to be nine points. And in order to win the game, you are going to need six of those points. So I figure that's a pretty good number. You can't win with just the two thrones, the level three and the level two. You need at least three thrones to win. So I think that will be a fair and well set up game where by the time someone, hopefully me, captures enough thrones to win the game that the end is really no longer in doubt. And of course I'm going to allow renaming. As we have become accustomed, the old Pantocrator is gone, there's chaos, wars, and destruction, and now the wheel is turned and pretenders are rising up to vie for control of the land of Atha Avin. 
We, of course, will be supporting Katarina von Ulm in her quest to save her nation and its people and dominate the lands. So stay tuned. Please leave a like on the video. I'd like to, if possible, get 50 likes for this new series, just to show that you're interested and you're following along. Please leave comments and have a good one.